and meanings of Beaver Island and whatnot. So I kept on and I finally sort of tracked down all the names. And there, there was just recently an article in the Beaver Beacon or something. They're talking about, uh, I'm going to ramble, but if you listen a little I'm, bit. I am just uh, the, uh, all ears. The, they were, there was a, uh, they're going to have a chamber of commerce. Well, I was attending the University of Detroit in the early, late 20s and early 30s, and they decided they'd have a chamber of commerce. And so, me, at the time being educated, as they say, there's only three or four people ever went to universities at that time. Charlie McCann was a dentist. Catherine studied music at the University of Michigan. Gerald Leff went to Notre Dame. And I went to the University of Detroit. They were about the only people that had that level. So they thought, well, you must be smart if you're going to college. So Mr. Wright had a... a uh, he was an engineer for a railroad in St. Louis, and he had a place on Beaver Island. And he and I and, and Bruce McDonough, who was lost in the... The Maryland. That, we got together, we studied Robert Rules of Orders and set the thing up. And we established a commission. And we went through a meeting where the people were to sit and hear about the organization, which we established membership and meeting procedures and everything. And at that time, there were four or five women who were in business. The hotel was run by Ray Gilden. Mrs. Bestman had a little store down on the shore. and. Uh, Eva Lafner and Lloyd owned the store, and we said we would, uh, I don't know, uh, I have the term, but we would support them having an auxiliary. And Uncle John jumped about this, said, who let the women in this? You know, <laughs> the, the prejudice thing. Mm -hmm. about <laughs> and of course, I went off to school, and then I left Chicago. Be round completely out of it. I went to Chicago and went to work, and then finally the war came. I was in the war for five years, so there was a, quite a break there where I was and then found. But we, it says they're going to stay. I said, and I recently, uh, I had found this document, or Nor, Nor, and Brother Norbert had. It's, it's already over there in the, your thing about the document about the, the uh, township meetings when it was called Chandler Township. Mm -hmm. And my brother Norbert had that. He had picked that thing up and he had moved in business down to Rochester, Indiana. And I used to tell them when we'd stop and see them, I says, that thing belongs in Beaver Island, that book. And so nothing happened after he dies. I kept telling Patricia, his daughter, I said, that belongs on Beaver Island. I mean, that's historical. Yes, it is. About how the people operated then like that. And finally she sent it to me. And I called the Michigan State Archives in Lansing and told them I had this thing. And uh, not long after that, I heard a young man, he was at up 10 the convention up here, that big Acme thing like that, and he was, he was in the State Archives. So he came along like you did, and we had a talk. I turned the book over to him and I said, I just want a couple of copies. And so uh, then the question is, it came back just like Xerox copies. <laughs> so 
about this time I got in touch with Cashman. First I tried to go through the, the beacon, but uh, I couldn't seem to get together with uh, Mr. Hooper very well. So, but uh, Cashman did, and I told him, I said, now this has to be bound properly. Uh, I'm just going to, you're only going to get the loose sheets on it like this. But I said, I'll pay for it. Don't, don't, not, not, no big problem there. He went and got them done for about $30 and it got the thing in the, in the, in your record. And another thing that I have in the record is that, and this may be connected with your family a little bit, is that after the grandparents died, uh, the house where your father and mother, maybe you were born there, right? I yes, know. I was born in, across the street. You were. Well, anyway, the, uh, the the house was vacant. My grandmother had died and everything, and the thing was up, going to be up for sale. And so, grandchildren and whatnot were going in the house sometimes and taking things out. And I ran across a surveying instrument that my grandfather had used way back and whatnot. He went into business with a banker from Chicago, foreman. They bought all kinds of land on Beaver Island. He owned an awful lot of land. And they had the old uh, telescopic surveying instrument. And they had the cha a chain, but Jimmy Tite borrowed that and that was lost. But the darn thing was made very similar to what Washington had when he was surveying back in the mountains, back in the whatnot. Is that right? So I did, did a little research and I found a name and I wrote to Philadelphia and the darn thing was built 125 years ago. All I did is to a viewer you look through two slots like this and it had a little one le little level and a tripod like this. But they must have done pretty good with it like that. So I turned that over to the, I got a letter here from the fellow that used to do that years ago. Beaver Island Historical Society. This goes back to August the 28th, 1985, Shirley Gladys. But there was an elderly man that was doing the same thing and I got this copy of the maker of the instrument and from down Pittsburgh. And that's quite a story. That's very interesting. Huh? And that would have been owned by your grandfather, you say? It what? That was owned by your grandfather? Yes. And which, which grandfather? Gallagher. Gallagher. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is, goes back. The society is pleased to new members welcome. Isn't that something? Well, when we go on. Well, I'd, I'd like to start from the beginning, if we could. Start with... Well, how... Uh, are you, you going to question me or what? I'd like to, if you're uh, agreeable to that. You could go over a, a, a simple outline of your years on the island and take it from there. The, these are the... A man named McCray owned the place. He's a vice president of People's Gas and Light in Chicago. He was into banding seagulls. Hugh Ray 
Does that name register with you at all? Yes, he had a summer cottage on the... Yeah, right, that south. nomad near your right. great-grandparents. And your great-grandmother was a great help on the school. When anybody graduated from high school, she'd have a little party up at No Man for them. I'd heard that. He was, she loved that old lady. Well, why don't you let Bob interview you, or rather? What? Why don't you let him interview you, and then you can do some of this stuff? stuff. No, it got to be, he wants to record this, so it has to go on this thing. I'm just going through quickly. Uh, Miss Grisella of Cleveland built that house up there on the hill. On the bluff overlooking yeah, the harbor. Yeah, it was owned right. by the Heflins. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Bundy family was up the road just a little bit, Bundy. That house and right Harry right. Bundy was quite a nice gentleman. He perfected the thing of copper tubing from the gas station to the carburetor in the old system. Hmm. Very wealthy. What a nice gentleman he was and his family. The Graham brothers that were manufacturing autos were around there, but this, uh, uh, these car business used to last a little while and they'd go out of business. I mean, right. There was hundreds of them started up. Smiley Daniels had a up on Donegal Bay on the bluff, and Smiley Daniels manufactured those bumpers, those two string bumpers. Mm -hmm. Wealthy. Used to come with a great big car. The tires then used to be like that. He had, they had little steps like that to get up <laughs> into the car because it'd be high cars like that. That was his nickname, Smiley, or was yes, it? Yes, yeah. Because I'd heard it, I'd read it printed Smalley, and I wondered... Smalley, but it could be. I'm not... Mm -hmm. This is just my getting a little... Then the Hoffmans and the Burns from Chicago, and they were associated with education in Chicago, and they had cottages back in the woods there, back of where that other church is, that, uh, like that. Dave Broder, do you know Brad's yeah. mm -hmm. connection? There was a Mrs. Redding lived up there off of Donegal near where uh, past Protar place up there. Mm -hmm. like. And the house that we lived in and is still over there was owned by Stephens, who had the he was head of the B. Brown Lumber Company. Right. And as far as my recollection is, 1915, he was gone, and we, my father, was able to buy the house there with the big barns and everything like that. That was the house near the Graham house or near the O'Brien house? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. There's a big story about the O'Briens, too. Uh, she, she was. Married to a dentist, and they had a farmers there. In the early days, when the air, when the lumber company was there, down on the street there was a bowling alley, a, a, a clothing store, and they had uh, a McCann store, and they had harnesses and whips and everything you could think of like that. Mm -hmm. The whole street was lined like that, and the, the ladies had a store in the hotel down the street, like this. And there was something here the other day, in the, either the courier or whatnot, and it told about uh, the, the Indian chief. I got some pictures here. I'm going to give you some of this stuff. Here's a picture of the Indian chief Thomas with my father and but not like that. And there's a picture we all almost won't believe of the harbor with one of the what's his name boats from the what not. Coast Guard. Unbelievable to look at that today and see that. Then as a kid, I was on the baseball team. Oh, 
There's me, Fon Sandberg, Lafayette, they call it. We used to play all around the Upper Peninsula, come over to Subway, down to Mackinac Island. I was a kid, 16, not playing with these men. I was quite an athlete in my younger day. Uncle Gus Milky, Paul Somerville of the Coast Guard was a pitcher. That's a picture of the old telephone on there. And we had a connection with Commander McDonald of the uh, start of the Zenith Corporation. Really? He came by from the east in his yacht and the uh, uh, doctor, P Papa, was the supervisor for Booth Fisheries for 25 years with the doc and nice and everything like that. And while McDonald was there, he, he got a call. We had the telephone to <laughs> in the house. And he had to leave immediately to get to Chicago to help organize the scene the corporation. And he left his mother and his sister in the big yard alongside the dock. My father used to see that they were comfortable and had water and ice and stuff like that. So they were, they were very friendly with Commander McDonald. And he sent the picture of his yacht, the Mizpah. He said, our home has been reported to the Navy for active service. Inez and Jean McDonald. That's a treasure thing. His yacht was was used taken over, taken over by the Navy. Uh, something like that. Johnny Andy had given me this picture. Got Uncle Joe and what's the name? Gillespie. I can't write. There's a whole male family of ours. There's my father, Uncle John. Grandfather, Uncle Joe, and Uncle Eddie. There's a picture Johnny Andy gave me then. The uh, 1990 Johnny stopped by and he gave me a couple of these pictures. There's hard to recognize people in that one. Well, uh, I'd like to pause for one second here. You are Earl Gallagher, and you are the son of? James and Catherine Gallagher. Okay. And you were born on Beaver Island in? Uh, March the 18th, 1910. Okay. And your grandfather was known as Bill Bowery, right? Yeah, it was William yeah, Bowery. And he was an immigrant from New York City, and his father was the immigrant and was a teacher in the public schools of New York. At that time, New York City was loaded with what they called cold flat, insanitary conditions, and the great-grandfather and grandmother had 13 children, but they all were dying off in young age. and. So finally there was three left, and doctors advised them, if you don't want to keep any children, get out of New York City. And we're talking back around the Civil War time in the country. And so grandfather, my grandfather had got up to be about 14 or 15, and he was a runner on Wall Street in which he would carry documents between the financial institution. The name Bowery remained with him to the rest of his life. When he died, the papers in Grand Rapids and whatnot had headlined with William Bowery Gallagher had died like this. And so he established and he had ten children on Beaver Island. And, uh, the, my father was the second in the order, like that. And unusual at that time, my 
and they acquired property up on the King's Road in one of those government thing, uh, things where they used to give land mm -hmm. if you developed it. I had never really traced that down, but that's about the size of it. And they had this nice big place, so they built log cabin barns and says, oh, you know, all the timber you wanted to do, things like that. And my father, unusual at that time, at that time they uh, were talking in the late 1800s, he was going to school and he went to Charlevoix and went through high school. He was highly schooled compared to everybody. He was always a great writer and he had accounting and business and stuff like that. So we had the, and there was tremendous fishing, but that, that fishing also had been there before the Mormons was some Irish, but not so many people living on Beaver Island, but there were some Irish people, and they used to catch the fish and salt them and ship them off in those sailing vessels, maybe down toward Detroit or toward Chicago, like that. So it was, the fishing was not new. But my grandfather fished ponded nets, in which the fish are not gilled, the fish are caught alive. And they, it, so there was some kind of a law then, I think it was called a riparian right law, in which the people that owned the land along the shore had rights to the water adjacent to it, or the river, half of the width of a river. So my grand grandfather bought Sand Bay from Boyle's Beach all the way to hell up there. Mm -hmm. and, and he bought land and Hog Island like this. And in the spring they would catch the white fish and the, the tremendously they scooped them up. And then they started these big ships like the Manitou that would stop in Charlevoix and then about twenty hours later the fish would be in Chicago. As a specialty the cold northern fish fresh at the Palmer House and the Stevens Hotel and all those places. He became so wealthy that he, he left the fishing to a couple of his sons. And in the, in the meantime, they were trying to establish an aquarium in Lincoln Park, as before the days of the Shedd Aquarium. And they, uh, so they sent up some containers of metal like this and had one fishing day catch some of the fish and put them in these tanks and then kept them alive for a couple of days by changing the water or we used to have a bicycle pump to put a little oxygen or air into the thing. I tell this story because that after that shown that they could do this for a couple of days, these fish were just taken and used and the, they timed the thing the next time is when that Manitou would be coming by at a certain time in Charlevoix. So we got them in the morning, had them aboard the Beaver Island boat at 1.30 over to Charlevoix and into Chicago. Now, who's going to go to Chicago? I'm 13 years old, but I participated in, in this change in the water and whatnot. And I never been to any place. <laughs> and I ended up taking the trip to Chicago with my grandfather and delivered the fish, the first white fish they had an exhibit down there. Uh, on a ship out of New Staten Island, New York, on the way to Europe. 
there were some other stories in between. We were sent out to El Paso, Texas, an airfield there, Bigsfield. And they start gathering, we were going to build an airport in England. And we had to get all the machinery, trucks and everything. And we were back across the country in August, and then they gave you the test, and they took tests on your blood and everything like that. And it wasn't long before we were on a troop ship, the Simony. She was a, had been a passenger cargo ship to Havana, Cuba, before the war. And up we go to Halifax, and we went in one of the earliest, biggest convoy you ever saw. There was troop ships, tankers, food ships, everything. And there were some British ships, supply ships that were all formed into this tremendous thing. And they had the battleship New York and the cruiser Philadelphia and about ten destroyers in the convoy. And we went out zigzagging around, blackout at night, no light, nobody, but not. Had a terrible accident. One of the ships in their zigzagging ran into a destroyer, and the destroyer had those barrels of depth charges on the stern, and a brand new destroyer blew up and killed 180 sailors in about five minutes. And this is in the dark at midnight, and the alarm came, prepare to abandon ship. I and the officer were in a state on the upper deck like this, and I can still picture it, and I said, what the hell do you do? They didn't have enough labels. We had 2,200 people on the ship. I said, what in the world do you do? So I took some identification and stuff like that. So if you're lost on the North Sea, maybe they identify a body. But after a while, they had this little radio system that could listen to, to uh, 10 miles or something like that. They communicated. Finally, they caught all clear and everything went back. Next thing is we're a beautiful day, something like this would be in August, we're crossing the ocean. And the Philadelphia the cruiser had two little float planes. And they'd come out at before dark or in the morning early and go around and look and see if there's any evidence of German submarines. We're sitting there on the upper deck looking out to the south, and we could see something I thought uh, just mad and might look like a pencil thing off in the distance. And along comes this little cruise uh, plane, float plane, coming back. We started thinking, you better get back before, before they'd, they had a big arm, they'd lift them off of the ocean like this, stick on the stern. And we went, uh, and when they, they, as he came back, he spotted this thing that we had seen, and he went over toward it, and he must have said something about it. And the destroyers, so they cranked up their thing with this smoke was coming on them, and they charged over, and they start firing their guns, and then they start dropping depth charges. After the war, I, I kept track of all this. I wrote to the Navy and wondered if they had the logs of any ships that to indicate that this was a uh, actually a action with a, with a submarine. And a ranking Navy man wrote back and says, no, they could not determine the, or trace through to see the senses. Was from what your description sounds very much like it was action with the submarine. Then we come through and, and we and pass North Ireland. 
into the first of four in their Glasgow garden. In which they took us out and took us across country to a city called Peterborough. Peterborough was famous for making great big engines for the freighters. The pranks and all that, to be couples to say. The Germans tried to bomb the town. It's kind of out of their range, but the, it's so important because of making the machinery. Well, we were to build an airport about 10 miles out of there, and we had nothing at first. We're living in tents. Fog would be sitting in the tents with us. Sit on the ground, they had, they had guest quarters and you got a little bit to eat. And finally they ordered, uh, they got equipment in and they said, uh, day and night and week, pour those run, pour that runway. And I was, I was an administrative officer and I had the, the food service and the motor pools under our direction and we got going and uh, I was trained by West Pointers when I, when I was going to school in Fort Elvore. I said to the officer that's directing this section of the school, I said, I don't know where I'm going to fit in this. He said to me, don't you worry, you will be fine the spots where you will be useful. You have, you have. Uh, you didn't ever need everybody out shooting everybody. So then the commander of the, the 836th Engineer was a West Pointer. And when they said work night and day, I thought of those poor kids going out there in the fog and cold at night and have nothing on their, uh, they had eaten at five or six o'clock. So I bought some potatoes from a farmer and had them cooked up in some bacon fat and said to the sergeant, give them some coffee or a piece of bread or something. And they had orders from the headquarters, don't buy anything in the United Kingdom because the food shortages in England after bombing and stuff. <laughs> so the uh, I kind of got uh, in letter from London from the headquarters says, what's this with you buying potatoes? So he called me into the office. He said, uh, I found out that those West Pointers and didn't run off and start blaming or food anything. Tell me what happened. I appreciate that. He said to me, I have here noticed that you bought some potatoes. Yes, sir. He said, did you know about the restriction on buying anything in there? Yes, sir, I do. There were signs all over. It says, don't buy, don't buy anything. And I told him why I did it. I said, I couldn't think of those young people going out there and admit, being, they wouldn't get off duty till 8 o'clock the next morning and be awful to be like that. And he said to me, you won't do it again? No, sir. <laughs> yes, sir, I won't not do it again. And he wrote a letter to the headquarters in London and says, the officer has been informed that it will not happen again. <laughs> I mean, he could have court-martialed me for breaking the rule, but he didn't like that. So then I transferred. Uh, I don't, I got transferred to the headquarters of the engineer intelligence in Western, across England, on the other side of England, and I was picked to establish a map depot for the incoming troops were coming in by the hundreds of thousands, and they would be placed and they'd be uh, train in training. 
And I had a staff of about 25 people and got to get maps and the training maps from that part of England. Then we had a attachment of engineers that produced maps. They had four color presses. And then they started, they had a photographer fly unit going all over Western Europe. But I had worked on the boats around there. I worked on the Rambler and I, I had a sense of direction in me. I arrived in Paris at eight or nine o'clock at night, blacked out, got my driver and the maps secure, and was assigned a little hotel down off of the Champs Elysees. And I was there till August of the next year. And I was promoted to a captain in near Christmas of 44. The yeah. great thing is that I was, I was still there in October of 1945. And then the Colonel Melwood and I we had orders out of Paris to move to Frankfurt and establish a map operation for the troops that were coming in, the young troops that were now going to be occupying troops. And that, then I, my orders ordered me back to the United States with captured maps and documents from the Germans and to deliver them to the Army Map Depot in Washington, D.C. So I took ship out of Antwerp, Belgium, out to the North Sea, and seven days later we're in New York Harbor. Quite accommodation. Delivered the maps, then Washington and it says report to your Fort Sheridan, Illinois for discharge. <laughs> At that time Victor, my brother, was being ordained a priest in Grand Rapids and I'd been away for over four and a half years. Well, <laughs> I had been injured in 1943. I spent the next four or five years in and out of Vets Hospital in an operation. Couldn't hold a job. I'm still rated a disabled veteran. Getting back to Beaver Island, I think that's what Bob wanted a lot more information on. Let's, uh, yeah, if we could, I'd, I'd like to go back to your childhood there and what you remember of the harbor and the industries, the lifestyle, the people you knew. Well, fishing was the big thing, and the, the mill, and uh, the mill. But Norbert had that better. He, had, uh, he used to keep a diary and it'd say, Shing, the tugs would come in sometime with the trout season, the water right to the gunnels like this. Now, uh, your family is connected in this, in the sense that uh, the, uh, what's his name, um, Raymond is your grandfather. Yes. And what's the other fellow? Everett was his Everett. brother. What? Everett was his brother. Yeah. And he became